And part of his argument is that groups may have realized that if they could buy, uh, if they could join together, that then they could take on another group and uh, share the resources that they pillaged. Now, part of the difficulty with that has always been, so how do you allow people into the group? Because allowing them in, of course, could be a very dangerous thing. And one hypothesis that occurred to me came about, it actually occurred to me in a very odd way. I was interested in something completely different as a result of a meeting Terry was organizing. And this had to do with unconscious mimicry. I thought, well, what, what is unconscious mimicry all about? The psychological literature on it is quite vast and very detailed and very respectable, but I'll just sum it up for you very briefly. The basic point is this. If you have a student and a confederate, the confederate is told to mimic in no way any of the mannerisms, the eye movements, the smiles, whatever, of the, of the student. And then they're given a task on which they work. At the end, uh, the student is debriefed. How did you feel about, you know, so and so? If there is no imitation, by and large, the students find the Confederate creepy. You know, I don't know, I just felt really uncomfortable. He didn't do anything, but you know, it just, I hate to say this, but there's something wrong with that guy. On the other hand, if there was a lot of imitation, they really liked them. They felt they were in sync, that there was a, a way that they were cooperating that was kind of special and unique. And sort of the, as long as you weren't sort of overtly mocking the other person, but just kind of, you know, looking this way when they looked that way and so forth, it turned out to work very well. And there were many related studies showing that if a person is really anxious about their social status, they will, unbeknownst to themselves, imitate to a much higher degree than they normally do in social interactions. So what does this have to do with beginning to explain how the group can expand beyond kin? I think that it's quite, I mean, the reason why I asked myself this question was, well, what good is all of this unconscious mimicry? Why do we do it so much? And, and of course, you're using quite a lot of energy in doing it. And the answer the psychologists give is that it increases social facility and, and so forth. But, but what I want to know is why is that a good thing? I mean, why do brains care about this? And believe me, you do it. I didn't really think I engaged in it until I watched myself in novel social situations and found out, you know, this person goes like this, I go like this. They smile, I smile. Very interesting. One thought is, goes as follows, that in the small unit, in the, in the parent-offspring unit, imitation by the offspring is extremely important. Now, we know that humans imitate to a much greater degree, or so we think anyhow, than many other animals. And we like it. and you know, it helps them learn, but there's something else that's going on, and that is that in the very early stages, it isn't just that the child is learning something and getting it by imitation instead of by trial and error, which is a lot cheaper. It's that that child's ability to imitate, to smile when you smile, long about three months old, right? To point when you point, and so forth, is the best indication you have of the normality of that child's social brain. If its social brain is, to use a scientific term, run amok, then it will not be able to engage in that kind of imitative behavior. And that's the best signal that a parent has that something is wrong. And I think the same is true at the larger level. When, for example, new people wish to enter the group, the very best first pass filter you've got is how they behave in this imitative fashion. And, and part of the reason I, I think that's true is anecdotal. 
um, but, but there's other, other data as well. The anecdotal part of the story goes like this, that when I was growing up, this was a very, very small village. Everybody knew each other, and we all lived on farms. And whenever anybody new came into town, we all knew that there was a new person. And they were sized up very quickly. And often the new people would come in because they would want to work on the farm for a while, and you know, long enough in order to accumulate a nest egg or what have you. And it was quite interesting that some of these people were given the boots very quickly. And the explanation from the parents or the friends was always, well, you know, we, we didn't feel right about them. There was something wrong with them. You couldn't trust them. You know, it, and of course, in a small village with no RCMP, no nothing, it's a huge cost, as it would be in the ancestral situation. It would be a huge cost to allow into the group somebody who turned out to have uh, a social deficiency of a kind that was dangerous. So I think there are two parts to the story. I think Sam Bowles, Although we hate that part of the story because we don't like to think that a major part of who we are is our having uh, our ancestors engage in intergroup lethal competitions, but almost certainly that's part of the story. There's another part of the story that may or may not have to do with trade. Uh, and I think another part of it clearly has to do with how we interact with each other in these very subtle ways. Now, um, I'm going to end quickly with just a point about reasoning. I think one of the things that, that I'm really deeply puzzled about, um, and I know many psychologists and neuroscientists are too, and that is, what happened to my slides? <laughs> um, <laughs> is what reasoning actually is. Now, of course, it, to a first approximation, we're taught, as we learn everything else, by being given examples of the good instance. This is to reason well. This person allowed heart overhead and see how, uh, how they, um, just ignore that for a moment. And so I really want to understand what it is when we are talking about reason in science. I want to understand what the psychological parameters are, and from the point of view of the brain, what that is. Now, if Rodolfo Linus were here, and I promised I'd imitate him for three minutes, uh, he would say, look, and he's taught me so much about how to look at problems in neuroscience, but he would say this, look, don't look at the problem from the perspective of a highly complicated organism like a human playing chess. If you do that, you're going to get totally confused. Remind yourself that nervous systems, that the evolutionary platform for nervous systems is movement. It's not being able to count. It's being able to move in such a way as to survive, uh, uh, to, to succeed in what Paul McLean called the four Fs, feeding fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. <laughs> and the sensory systems, and later the additions to the sensory systems, are in the pay of behavior. That's the only way you can get the thing to go, evolutionarily speaking. And consequently, um, when you look at cognition from that perspective, I think it kind of removes the temptation to think that there's emotion on the one hand and that there's reason on the other and that these are two completely different things. I think in the nether regions they are kind of different, but I think in between there's just a real miss where you can't really separate it out. 